Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's a, we're getting to the tough part of the, the quarter. I think also we're competing with Noam Chomsky, which may have something to do with why there aren't <laughs> isn't more people here. Um, but still, we're. Uh, I, my name is Stephen uh, Tobin. I'm one of the organizers of Inclusive Gathering. This is our fourth, along with uh, Carla Sur and Jimena Rodriguez. Um, we've had, like I said, this is the fourth. We've had three. Before this, Hot Moments in the Classroom with Emma Nalibal Petit and Edna Chavari from Santa Monica College came to talk about making space uh, in uh, inclusivity in, in the syllabus. And then this, and then Jerry Kang gave one about politics and inclusive pedagogy uh, last month. And then this one's Classroom Design and Inclusivity with our panel. And then the next one, the final one we have, is with Frank Tuitt, uh, who's talk is called Realizing a More Inclusive Pedagogy, Race, Identity, and Engagement in a Diverse College Classroom. That one is in two weeks on Wednesday, uh, May 15th, and that'll be in PAL 186. So thank you all for coming. Um, we look forward to uh, this lively discussion about classroom design and its relationship with inclusiveness. And I will let our moderator, uh, Adrian Levine, present to everyone as well as yourself. Great, great. Well, thank you. I'm even wondering if we should have everyone present themselves. <laughs> it's not that large, and we can do that quickly, mm -hmm. and it can be more of a conversation. So I'm Adrienne Levine. I am the faculty director of what is now called the Center for the Advancement of Teaching, and I've been a faculty member here in mechanical and aerospace engineering for 35 years. And when Stephen first approached me, he actually approached me as a panelist, to be a panelist, and I said, wow, there's there's people on this campus who know way more about this topic than I do, mm -hmm. um, so I will connect you to them, mm -hmm. and <laughs> um, and then be asking for the moderator. I was happy to do that, um, and I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves for simplicity, and we'll start here and go around. And I think everybody just say your name and where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm in the. Uh, my name is Rob Rogers. I'm the manager of learning spaces uh, for CAT, as I like to call it, um, and I'm responsible for the media technology in general assignment classrooms, and I'm also heavily involved in the classroom renovation and design process. And I will take this moment to interject that um, people love to talk to Rob about specific classrooms and the issues they have in those classrooms, and he's happy to address those questions, but let's like, not make that a part of this. Um, I'm Jan Reif. Uh, I'm a professor of history, statistics, and digital humanities, and I'm a, uh, the, um, what am I? <laughs> I'm the special assistant to the executive vice chancellor and provost for online instruction. And like Rob and Adrian, I'm a member of the classroom advisory committee that is dealing with a whole series of these issues of how to think about classrooms as well. And so one of the things I will talk about is the fact that maybe we shouldn't be asking just about classrooms, but uh, the fact that there are all kinds of ways to make not the classroom a place for <coughs> inclusivity and dealing with issues of diversity. Hi, I'm Tara Prescott. I'm a lecturer in writing programs, and I'm a faculty in residence here at UCLA, which means my family and I live in a residence hall with the students. Um, I also teach classes in my living room there. Uh, so that's one of the things I'd like to talk about is getting out of the classroom. Um, and maybe after we do our full intros, I can tell you a little bit more about some of the spaces that I, that I teach in that are options for people on campus. Hi, I'm Kamiko Haas. Um, I'm the Director of Instructional Improvement Programs in the uh, Center for Advancement of Teaching. teaching. And uh, what I do is I typically um, work with faculty um, in different capacities, both in terms of training, but also consultation, to think about their teaching. And um, I try to think of teaching in sort of more general, uh, overall, what they are um, interested in, but sometimes um, space and sort of how that um, impacts uh, your teaching and how students learn um, do come up. So I guess that's why I'm here. Hi, my name is Cole Jack Pittman. I'm a PhD student in the English department. Uh, in addition to being a TA on campus, I also work on Grad Student Orientation, Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity Day, um, and I am the disability coordinator for that. And I've been the coordinator for three years now, so I work a lot on 
accessibility both for graduate students and also undergraduates. Mm -hmm. In the audience, whoever wants to <laughs> Malina Stefanowska, professor in French and Francophone studies. Jimena okay. Rodriguez in the Spanish and Portuguese department. I'm Andy Martinez, um, writing programs. Uh, Carla Sur, I teach here in the department of Spanish and Portuguese. Federica Di Blasio, PhD candidate in the Department of Italian. Uh, Thomas Carvalotti at the Center for Humanities <laughs> Technology. Excuse me. Um, Michael Marcotte, a uh, second year undergrad economics major. Nice. Okay. I'm uh, Alejandra Campoy. I'm a grad student in Complet and I'm the GSR for Epic. Great. Great. Yes, and I did want to, s I neglected to say that I'm really happy to. Um, be involved in an EPIC gathering mm -hmm. because uh, EPIC is doing such great things on this campus. I'm happy to be mm -hmm. associated with that. So a couple of the panelists have slides that they want to show. Um, should we let's start with whichever one you have sure. queued up, I guess? Um, I guess we'll Rob. start with Rob <laughs> over here. And Rob, I have, you can just okay. go forward and back with it. To the right. So I just brought a few pictures of uh, what we've been working on recently, uh, just to show some of the changes in classrooms that have been happening in the last few years. Some of the uh, we're trying to uh, sort of modernize and achieve more of a uh, flexible classroom style rather than a fixed classroom mm -hmm. style. And I just wanted to show just a couple of examples of where that's going. Um, this is, uh, this is an actually an active learning classroom, and this is in Volter Hall in engineering. Uh, a couple things to point out in reference to uh, inclusivity. One is that you can see that we have uh, tables of different heights. Uh, it's been shown that students uh, very often are, many students will come in and immediately gravitate towards this, either because of their own height or because of they want a smaller table or just their comfort level or their ability to see. So we try, and in some of the rooms, we can't do it everywhere, but in some of the rooms we're trying to have basically a variety of types of seating. And I would actually like to go much farther than this, mm -hmm. uh, but at least for in some of the active learning classrooms you'll see that. These are also movable tables, movable chairs. Uh, there are four projectors in this room, actually five. There are four small projectors and five. This is an active learning classroom, if you're familiar with that concept. There are currently two on campus, and this is the one that's uh, down in Bolter Hall. Uh, this is the other one. It's in Haynes. Um, basically the same thing. You can't see them, but the high tables are in here. Um, there's five projectors, one for the front of the room, and then four, two on each side that are for group work. Uh, the nice thing about this one is, is that I'm currently scheduling it, so if somebody wants to use it, they can contact us and we can get it on the schedule uh, before the registrar then schedules it for other rooms. So people are interested uh, in making use of the classroom and its special features, it's something that we can certainly talk about. And it seats 44? Uh, they both seat 44. So um, this is a before picture. This is the lovely Math Sciences 5117. Um, you can see that it's pretty classic um, UCLA in that there were fixed seats. Uh, as you can see, many of them were broken over the years and replaced with different uh, tablets. Um, this is what it looks like now, and obviously the feature here, and these are two of the students who work for me who volunteered to get their picture taken, mm -hmm. is that they can turn and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, this room was built where all of these seats actually uh, rotate. Wow. So oh. it allows for group work. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about a 35 seat classroom. Um, one of the interesting parts is this is in math, and math doesn't really use this a lot. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but we have six of them now here, and we're building more, and you'll see that soon. Uh, but this is a this is a big change for uh, just the ability for students to work together. As you can see, those other chairs, mm -hmm. uh, we've all sat in them, and you know it's basically impossible to turn around and mm -hmm. talk to somebody without hurting yourself. Right. So these will all rotate around, and you can actually set up groups of two to four to six. Mm -hmm. uh, they still are fixed to the floor because of capacity issues, but nonetheless, they're able to do this. Did you, you lose how many? For, uh, there were 44, 45? Maximum These, before. well, actually, interestingly enough, uh, and this is the sort of thing that I find fascinating in my line of work, 
is that these rooms were actually built with a low capacity on purpose, initially. Mm -hmm. So these didn't lose any seats at all, because mm -hmm. math has a certain size class they want to teach. Mm -hmm. And so these rooms would actually have sat more people, but they didn't. Uh -huh. So when we, were able, when we did this, which normally removes one or two seats per okay. row, mm -hmm. we didn't have to here. It's one of the reasons why we put them here initially. Oh, right. So normally it's one or two seats per row. Okay. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? Sure. One of the things we were doing with graduate students in the various workshops and discussions we had was the question that for people who are heavier than most, these mm -hmm. desks don't work at all. Mm -hmm. Do these arms lift up or oh, they all do. For that? Yeah, okay. they do. Yeah. Uh, and all of these kinds of seats have liftable arms. They often will fold down. Uh, yeah, it's, it's partly an accessibility issue, but right. yeah, we don't do any with fixed. None of the new things we're doing have a fixed Great. tablet. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hate those. Uh -huh. uh, and <laughs> there are, and you can find some on campus where actually, and this is really nice, it's so close to the wall, mm -hmm. and it's a left-hand seat that's close to the wall, you literally have to climb into the seat. Yeah. yeah. So, it's bunch. Bunch yeah. like that. Bunch. Yeah. I uh, every day. <laughs> so we're trying to fix that. Uh, bunch is next year. Okay. So, okay. Um, another question. Yes. Um, in terms of accessibility for those types of seats, are there empty spaces left over yes. for wheelchair users, yes. rollator users? Um, for any any classroom like this, um, actually, you might be able to see it. But what there is is that there's basically a tablet on a post mm -hmm. that you then pull the wheelchair up to, and that's sort yeah, of the new right way. To, I think it's yeah, right I think you can see see it. yeah, I think you can see it. It's just on yeah. the other side of her. That's sort of the new way to do this rather than doing a table, mm -hmm. because it makes it much more accessible. It also allows uh, greater mobility around the room that way. So that's what we're doing in most rooms. If you look at some of the lecture halls we've done recently, you'll see that the front row very often will just have posts and then has the companion seat, uh, if necessary, next to that post. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question about egress, is the door automated for someone in a wheelchair? No, they're not. Um, that is something that has been discussed. Um, code doesn't require it for a classroom. So since code doesn't require it, it's not currently being done. Um, it's something to talk about. It is a much bigger expense and it's a maintenance issue. Um, so, but we have changed the door handles to make it more accessible. Um, code pretty much tells us what to do and then we go beyond code in a few things. Uh, and in this particular case, that's how we do the doors. And then finally, uh, one more. So now this is, uh, this is in Dodd Hall. Oh, yeah. These are, and you'll never see it looking like this. Um, <laughs> no, you will never see anything like yeah. this. Um, but these are movable tablet on jets. Mm -hmm. um, and they're pretty great. Mm -hmm. I mean, they yeah. really are. They allow for uh, group discussions. You can actually push these together to make a table. Mm -hmm. um, they hit every OCD button I have, which are many. Uh, because it never looks like this, and we put in signs, we put in marks on the floor, it just doesn't matter. But most of the, we got very positive response about these. Um, and it's been very popular, they, they allow for group work better than anything else does. These are a particularly good design, it's a place in the bottom for uh, students to put their bags, which normally chairs don't have that. These swing around so they actually work for both left and right handed people. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the table, the tablets move around so they do fit people with different sizes. Mm -hmm. These are great. Uh, they're expensive. We try and color code them so they stay in the rooms that has generally been successful so far. Mm -hmm. And um, they're limited. We've discovered that about 30 ish is about as many as we want in a room. Mm -hmm. After that, it just becomes just crazy. Uh -huh. Uh, but for a room of that size, a discussion section type room, we see them in circles, we see them all pushed to the side where mm -hmm. people, are, they, they allow for a lot. I thought, I thought there and, and the students love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. The students really like it. The students yeah. really like it. Uh, yeah. And then finally, this is a artist representation of what's actually happening this summer in uh, Royce. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, we got a grant, actually a gift, from the Amundsen Foundation to upgrade four rooms for the Humanities Division. Uh, three of them are in Royce and one of them is in Dodd. 
Um, so what we've done is this is the one that's going to get tables and chairs, and then the other two will have alternating rows of uh, rotating seats. We discovered in math that you actually don't have to have every row rotate. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're able to keep capacity-ish mm -hmm. up by only having every other row right. rotate. So um, these rooms in Royce are going to be very nice. Um, this one is essentially an active learning room without all the technology. We've got writing surfaces on multiple walls, which is a big thing. Uh, the tables and chairs will move, so you can have different size groups. And this is going in this summer uh, There's as part of our summer projects this year. So that's what I have. Mm -hmm. um, and I can talk a little bit more later on about how this relates to the research and the inclusivity and how classroom design relates to inclusivity, but I just wanted you to see the pictures of what we have been doing and what we will be doing. Okay. Okay. So this was part of a, a lightning talk I did for Epic, so I guess this will be like the quantum version of that. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about some of the unusual spaces that we have for teaching that people either don't know about or don't think about. Um, uh, yeah, so that's us. <laughs> um, I take students off campus to Long Beach to the Aquarium of the Pacific. Um, that's actually me in the uh, orange suit behind them. <laughs> I'm wearing a full face mask so I can uh, lecture and talk and answer questions while I'm in the water. Wow. Um, and we talk about uh, eco marine ecology and animals and so forth. Um, I do service learning courses, as does Carla. Um, so getting the students into different communities in Los Angeles and different spaces and having the learning happen there. So in this case, my students are partnered with uh, A26LA in Mar Vista, which is same themed after a, uh, a time travel mart. Mm -hmm. So they sell everything from futuristic robots to, I don't know, fossils. This is a, a telephone booth that gives you poems when you listen to it, the sorts of things. Um, I'll just go through these quickly. I have all this information. If you want contact information later, I can get, give them to you. Uh, this is my Fiat Lex, one of my Fiat Lex courses, James Joyce's Ulysses, which I teach in my living room um, on campus. Uh, we read a 700-page, really incredibly hard novel in 10 weeks in a one-unit course. Um, and students voluntarily do this um, because it's fun and low stakes, low pressure. Um, and I find lots of ways to kind of break down the hierarchy between uh, the professor who professes at the top and the lowly students. I just don't, don't agree with that at all. So teaching up in the space where they live and where they sleep and where they have their meals really helps uh, break that apart and inviting them into my home, which you can't do if you live off campus. But um, there are other ways of having that homely experience. It could be in your office hours or even finding a faculty in residence who's willing to, to program with you. Uh, these are just uh, some of the students that were reading children's books in the class uh, to each other and to my baby. Because um, if you really want to know how a child reacts to a board book, it helps if you have one. Um, this is the students uh, sitting on the floor. Uh, they sort of spread out in various places in the apartment in small groups. Um, and again, changing the dynamic of sort of that stiff, we are in an educational environment to something that's closer to the way that people actually read these types of texts. Um, I created what I think of as like the, the writing lab practical, so something I borrowed from biology where you have little stations, which again could be done in any really classroom. It's harder when you have 200 plus students, but you can create stations in different corners of the room or even in the hallway. Um, and then they have time at each station to interact with something to read, to write, and then move. And it kind of keeps things um, energizing. So this student is writing in relation to uh, what she was seeing outside. It was raining that day. These students were opening little mailbox, um, little mailboxes, and then they would have to write about whatever objects they found. These are students doing magnetic poems on my fridge. Uh, most classrooms do not have refrigerators, but a lot of them have magnetic surfaces, including, strangely, trash cans. Um, I've also brought in pizza, pie tins, um, these sorts of things, so students can work with a set vocabulary. Um, and again, it removes perfectionism when you have a, the constraints of it has to be done in a certain amount of time, and you don't have all the words at your disposal. 
It's also fun. Um, this is actually in a kitchen space up on the hill. This is the hitch kitchen or the hitchin. Um, and as you can see, it, it is set up with a really nice widescreen TV. Um, honestly, the AV capabilities I've had on the hill are far better than what I have on main campus. Um, so in this case, they were doing a Skype interview with the author of the book that they were reading. Oops, it looks like it's uh, the maker space. So there's going to be a new one up on the hill that's even bigger. This is a space that has 3D printing, laser etching, woodworking, um, just all kinds of hands-on materials. Um, and you can reserve that space and teach a class in it. Again, it has to be on the smaller side, um, but it's a great resource. Um, we did a, a knitting class, actually, up there. And uh, one of my colleagues, who's also a faculty in residence, Dr. Jenna Carpio, she did Chicano 19, How It's Made, Conversations About Power and Tools. What better way to think about power and tools than actually using power tools, which is amazing. And then after they, all the students made their projects, they had um, sort of like an art display where you could go and see what they had created as part of the class. And this also, these are move, movable tables and chairs, so you can have it set up whatever works for your class design. Uh, the nest, this is this uh, sort of stadium like seating in the garden which is ADA accessible on South Campus. Um, they also have an indoor space for when it's raining that can be reserved, although I think those have to be classes that are tied to botany. But anyone can use this space. Um, and this is just nice, uh, honestly, for mental health reasons, to get students out in nature and out of the classrooms and to introduce them to a resource that they probably didn't know existed um, because it's hidden in the depths of South Campus. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Can we do questions right away? Or? Sure, we can. Let me say something about how, how we'll organize things. So um, this can be extremely informal. The panelists are behind a table, and they look very official. But actually, anyone can contribute both questions and answers, or comments, whatever you want to call it. Um, I have a set list of questions. And what I envisioned was that I would ask each question, get a couple of responses from panelists, turn to the audience for either more commentary or related questions, and then move on to the next. But we can start with the question. Okay. <laughs> it's a question for Tara. Um, I have taken my students outside on campus, and I don't know, some like that, and some. Did they feel dis they were distracted, or what was it that they had objections to? Like they were, okay, what are we doing? What are we doing? Well, and it, it, it's yeah, I thrive off that. <laughs> to, you know, to keep up with the class and, uh -huh. and everything. And I did, it, I, I did it a couple times, and I always have the same kind of mix response. Do you prepare them bef in the class before about where you're going to meet, what you're going to do that day, dressing appropriately, all that kind yeah, of thing? Kind Notice that we're gonna get out next classroom. <laughs> Please feel comfortable to wear. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And they still. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's just pushing them out of their comfort zones so that they've yeah, never had a class that was so, outside, yeah. um, which I don't think is necessarily a reason not to do it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You hear all the tour guides that are going on right now, and they talk about how great our weather is. It's so wonderful, and yet our classes aren't outside. It's just strange. Um, but it may be maybe soliciting feedback from students afterwards about how did that go, what would you have preferred, what reactions are. In most cases, I find um, as long as you give them a heads up that they should have sun protection or bring layers or whatever it is, um, most seem to like having a change of pace. So I don't know. What are these uh, first years or what? what? This is a mix. Uh, yeah, it depends. Huh. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, the feedback we get um, mm -hmm. are in a couple of ways, and I teach out of the classroom a lot, too, um, physically, not just. Uh, so the Sunset Bus has been one of the places we've uh, done classes. We've done uh, joint classes with high school kids in historic Filipino town, where mm -hmm. they, we had the local high school kids give the tour of historic Filipino town to our students, and our students did the research for them. Um, you know, so there are a lot of different ways that we've been taking advantage of this. We've asked about outside, 
And one of the complaints, two of the complaints that come up all the time is, one, that it's far harder to hear outside, depending on where you are. And so that becomes one of the issues that the students are concerned about, that if it's really a discussion, there's, there's both distraction and, and not a quiet place like down in the Matthias Garden and so on, that that's one of the issues. The other is that explaining why you're outside. So a lot of the examples that you're using, it's very clear in the kind of curricular way why you're there. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's you're in the aquarium mm -hmm. or you're in the, the garden and things like that, or you're in a place for maker spaces and things like that. The feedback we've gotten with that, or I've gotten that, is as long as they understand why it's there and it's not just a diversion, mm -hmm. you know, and particularly if they're kinds of things that, you know, get it out of the way. So nobody in my class, when they went down to clean up day with historic Filipino town, had a question about why they were there, right? Mm -hmm. It was part of getting to know the community, and besides, they got to meet Manny Pacquiao, which was the big uh, <laughs> plus. But where they have that kind of clear sense, or you've got an assignment tied to being on the, the bus and things like that, then they're much more they have a sense of how this is really fitting in the class and, and so on. So those are the, I'm not sure that those are necessarily valid. I mean, they're, they're responses from students about how that fits in and why you might want to or not want to do it. Yeah, if I can comment on yeah. that, I actually, I actually taught a class uh, on Indian, of Italian language uh, outside a few times. And it worked because I asked them to uh, describe their surroundings. So mm -hmm. I was using the fact that we were outside as a purpose for them to speak. So they, they appreciated that. Yeah. And it made sense for them. Yeah, yes, I have a question for you, actually. You've already kind of touched on my question, but I wanted to ask, what's the audio like at the nest in, down there? Like, can, you, can they hear it? It's fairly quiet. I mean, I usually do, um, they're usually doing free writing. So it's a quiet thing anyway. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and if we're doing peer review, they're usually doing it in pairs. Um, so it's no different sitting next to someone talking to them than it would be in the classroom. Okay, so it's usually when they go out there, they're doing individual work or pair work. You're not like lecturing or having. No, although I don't, I don't tend to lecture anyway. Or like, um, you don't but to occasionally you'll get um, the emergency helicopter from Ronald Reagan yeah. going yeah. over. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of the extent of it. And then I had one more question, unrelated, but what did, what did you use the knitting for in your composition class? Knitting we were reading a text called Bitch Planet. Yeah. Um, you're familiar? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's all about being non-compliant, um, and there's a knitting pattern uh, that has this non-compliant logo at the back of the book. And so we wanted to talk about the hierarchy of art, you know, that uh, women's or domestic uh, lesser things, you know, textiles, fabrics are not considered art because they're pr predominantly were done by women, um, whereas, you know, men did paintings and therefore paintings were art. Um, so we were kind of talking about dismantling that while also making something that's in the book um, and teaching knitting. And on top of that, I specifically looked for uh, knitting instructors um, that didn't necessarily match what our expectations would be. So. Of, yeah, I had male instructors, I had people of various ages, um, and then we all got together and knitted. <laughs> just to yeah. talk about the um, botanical garden space, um, just, just in general, I think one of the things about outdoors is that you can't control um, the sound. You know, sometimes you have mm -hmm. the, someone you know, mowing and you know, other students, but typically the, I've, I've, been, I've been there a couple of times, one with when a, um, one of the graduate students who was teaching in that space. I find because of the way it's structured and because of the trees and foliage, you actually don't hear, even though the um, street is in, uh, right next to it, you, it's actually pretty quiet. It's kind of a bowl. It, mm -hmm. has, it has a certain sort of, I think it's both sort of yeah. the way it's structured, but also the trees sort of insulate <laughs> and um, but the the other thing about so I, I find that space to be fair for an outdoor space is actually uh, fairly quiet except for the the, the challenge is f having students find it yeah that yeah. honestly <laughs> but is the real the other thing about outdoor is um, writing space mm -hmm. is that you don't necessarily have a space to sort of write and if you want them to to work on stuff you have to sort of think a little bit of ahead mm -hmm. um, but um, going back to what Tara and also what Jan had said I think it really 
sort of thinking through why you are using the space and sort of preparing the students and letting them know what to sort of expect, I think makes a huge difference. And then students do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody use the space outside the Coatsen? There's that natural amphitheater, or they built an amphitheater outside of that at all? You don't, is that, did you have to reserve that, mm -hmm. or is that something you can just... You said the Coatsen? <coughs> I don't the, even know what that is. The Fowler Museum? The Fowler, outside oh, the, the Fowler. Museum. Oh. The, co it, the Coatsen yeah. is for archaeology. For archaeology. Right. It can be reserved. I don't know whether you have to reserve it, but they use it for receptions and things mm -hmm. like that. So it's probably one of those places where one can Sneak in. double check. I mean, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> basically open so you yeah, can yeah. use it, but a lot of the, the groups do use it for receptions. It has a nice, yeah. a nice layout. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one thing I just want to add, just in terms of outdoor versus um, teaching in other spaces, uh, so as someone who's hard of hearing, it's very hard as soon as we exit the classroom, and this is a problem for me when I'm teaching as well, um, all of a sudden I'm going to get maybe 40% of what someone's saying, 35%, um, and that's if you are not using assistive technology. So just the thing I would say, like using it in makerspace where you have access to technology, mm. using it in places where if you have someone who's going to be using some kind of assistive technology and they do need power especially, um, for someone who, say, is not going to be using ASL in their deaf and they're going to be having someone typing for them, looking at the machines, you need to be able to not have a lot of glare off of that. Mm -hmm. And if you're having translators, they need to know where you're going to be, like, sometimes two weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. So letting them know, like, far in advance if you yeah. have anyone who has assistive technology so that they can schedule technology mm -hmm. assistance, have battery packs, yeah. things like that, which can take, like, weeks as opposed to, like, one week that normally someone might need if they don't need those kind of assistive mm -hmm. devices. And I wonder if Bruin Kent will follow me. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I did want to mention that uh, we don't have any specifically designed for outdoor teaching spaces at UCLA. Mm -hmm. uh, the nest is not that. Mm -hmm. It's nice. Yeah, it's been there forever. Yeah. It's yeah. not yeah. for that. Uh, we could have one if there is demand. Uh, yes. It's yeah. the sort of thing. Uh, I'm not the person to edit, uh, but if it were to bubble up from the academic side through deans, etc., there are a lot of places on this campus where we could create an outdoor space with writing surfaces, even with assistive technologies. There's a lot of places where we could do that. Uh, and we do have the weather for it, and it's something a lot of universities have. Uh, it just has to be... How do we start the bubble? Uh, you talk, talk to your dean. Um, that's usually the best way to get something done. It, it needs to get to the, talk to the dean would then go to what's called the space committee, mm -hmm. and the space committee and all the deans know who that is. <laughs> and um, it's just it wouldn't be that hard to do. There are a lot of places we could do it, um, and it's something that I've looked at for quite a while. We look at outdoor study spaces, which we have some, is something we have been able to do in the last couple of years. Uh, we want to do more of that. But a specific for teaching outdoor space would be absolutely wonderful. And you can do things like awnings to block the sun. There's a lot of possibilities. We don't have that yet, but it's just a perfect place to do one. So, but it has to come demand. We fill demand. And so if demand comes from the academic side, then we could potentially make that happen. Isn't that where we are naturally headed, given shortage of? <laughs> 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 oh my God. We will. <laughs> Well, I've seen people teach, I've seen people have their students lined up on stairways, yep. uh, yeah. on all sorts of places. And, I mean, that works, but we, it wouldn't be that hard to do a, a one thing, it's a lot cheaper than building a building. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it would be possible to do, there just needs to be, come up from the academic side. And the other way of just flipping it around, we've, some of the uh, online courses where it's really have taken people out of the classroom entirely, have thought about how do you use the campus in innovative ways. So. Uh, one of the courses has its first assignment, and this speaks to some of the issues of diversity. This is a, a course on um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. where their first assignment is to go take a selfie where a wheelchair can't go on campus, mm -hmm. and then to discuss. It's a great assignment. Another one of the classes, which is um, African history, they do a um, uh, scavenger hunt up on campus of where you can find African artifacts and information. You know, so that's part of engaging people on campus. And there are a whole bunch of kind of interesting models out there where people are really thinking about how to get rid of the classroom in, in some ways and 
use alternate ways of engaging students in, in active learning. But then coming back to the campus or, you know, doing, uh, we're talking about a class right now that uh, is literature and various cities. And so how can you give the hints on how to read a city by doing what one of several other people have done with LA is if you go to Westwood and do a tour, what time, what kind of frames, how it's being used and things like that. So it's another way of kind of flipping around, even if you're outside of the classroom all the time, to take advantage of the, cl of the campus and get people engaged there as, as a place to study things and get, uh, learn how to do different methods. All right, I'm gonna bring us back to our original questions, <laughs> formal questions. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, so this one is very broad, and I'll throw it to the panel first, and as I said, open it up. How does the spatial design of classrooms affect the inclusiveness of the classroom environment? Who would like to, to address this broad question? Okay, um, I'll take okay. a stab. I think I would go back to what the discussion we just had mm -hmm. is it's really clear that Classrooms can limit inclusiveness and particularly active learning, which is kind of what we've been talking about here all along. But when, if one is thinking about inclusiveness and so on with some kind of basic things, there are different levels of inclusiveness that we talk about. So there's access, there's the kind of what does it mean to have a classroom that involves everybody in terms of an equal way, there are all kind of things. A lot of that is course design. You know, and, and thinking about then how to implement it. You're lucky if you're in a, one of your new classrooms, right? Um, and I teach mostly up in the hill, so I have better resources than uh, we have on campus. But it's that kind of, how do you think about uh, what, what are the levels of dealing with the topic, with the dealing of the creative ways of emphasizing these things and so on. and then you try really hard to figure out how the space maps into it. You know, so um, one has, I've been in some terrible classrooms that have been pretty inclusive because of the materials, because of how you've handled it and so on. And then I've been in some classrooms where the biggest issue is not the classroom itself, but rather how you've thought about making this happen inside the course. So I think they really feed on each other and I think to pick up one of the points Rob makes all the time, that one of the things that often happens is that um, if you're lucky enough to get into one of the classrooms that is far more flexible in terms of space and has all these other things, uh, a lot of places actually teach people how to teach in those classrooms to basically say you're, um, you don't have to think about everything just being in one place. You, thinking about all kinds of different ways to group people, to have the active classroom, to come up with the questions, to be able to be responsive to all the people who are there. So I think it's, it's a plus when you can do it, and it's, it can be really a limitation. I've taught in bunch a lot, <laughs> um, you know. And, you know, and some of those classrooms are just... How, how will they do bunch? <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those places are just painful. They, oh, by yeah. the time you get 15 people in there, they can't move, and you know, mm -hmm. and uh, then it's nice that it's close enough to Louval or whatever that yeah. you can I break them up. Open and the door and let them go outside and yep. work in small groups, and eventually yeah. we'll get together. But it's impossible to teach there. <laughs> um. So a lot of the research about inclusivity in classroom focuses on K-12. Um, but some of the things that, that I was able to find, uh, some of it is interesting in terms of, for example, when I talked about the different seats, um, there are people who are comfortable in the front of the room, there are people who are not comfortable in the front of the room. And so if you give the people in the back of the room a different height level, then they can become, they can't hide. Uh, as someone who always sat in the last row, I mean, you see where I tried to sit here. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I, and very often I could hide, and that's partly because of my height. I was nervous about my height. So I would always sit in the back of the room and very often would not be part of any discussions. 
when I would sit in rooms where it was in a circle or in any sort of format where I couldn't hide, then I was able to find my voice and be able to speak. Some of the interesting things are, um, one that I found very interesting, which I read about today, which speaks to an issue that I had a couple of years ago, and I won't mention who this was, but one department wanted uh, artwork of Nobel Prize winners, their Nobel Prize winners or their award winners, in the classrooms. Well, those were all males. Those were all white males. And at the time, we said no, because for one thing, it was expensive and time consuming. And But now I read about it, and those sorts of symbols in a classroom can have an effect on people. And so removing that kind of symbolism from a classroom does make it feel more inclusive when you're not looking around the room and seeing a bunch of people who don't look like you, uh, who are on the walls, and then the person in the front of the class may not be that. And so we're trying to look at symbolism, we're trying to look at uh, even colors to make things more lively and bright so everything isn't sort of institutional. There's a lot of things we're looking at in terms of this inclusivity. The idea that space and inclusivity are tied together is relatively new. Uh, when I look at the research, most of it's been done in the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I've been doing a lot of reading about it, and we're going to try that. For us, it's mostly focused on what we can do just to make the general learning environment better, and that's to make everybody in the room more comfortable. And that includes things like some of what we're depending is as the one you can probably all relate to is the air conditioning. Uh, Particularly on this side of this building. Uh, okay. Uh, no, it wasn't air conditioned for a long time. Well, yeah, there are places that still aren't air conditioned. I mean, this one got it, but a lot still don't right. have it. But classroom HVAC is something that's a big deal. Lighting is something we're addressing. Lighting on this campus has been generally awful, uh, and it's one of the things we're trying to address in all classrooms. Uh, the presentation, how to get um, better presentation systems, all that sort of thing, to make everybody in the room more comfortable and everybody in the room feel like they're more part of it. The biggest thing is flexible, um, and that's hard to do because of capacity issues, but we're doing the best we can. As you said, there were some examples of that, and we're trying, every new classroom we build, we're trying to make it flexible if we can. So this summer we're building two larger rooms with 120 seats that will have alternating uh, rows that can turn around and talk to each other, which allow for a larger classroom to have some of the features that the smaller classrooms have. So since I work with faculty, um, I tend to sort of try to think of things that what faculty can do. It's great uh, to, to have the classroom, you know, accommodate that, but sometimes we're limited to what we, we um, are, the space that we're put in. So um, when, I th when I talk to faculty, I try to get them to think about, um, you know, inclusivity, what does that mean? And it, I think the main thing is that students, um, making students feel that they are welcome there, that they're valued. Um, that they should and, and um, making them want to be there and also um, that they are heard, um, that they're, it's not just a, a one way as you said, it's not just the, the, the professor or the faculty is telling them that, that this is a learning space. So um, when I talk about different activities, I think one of the things, and I think Jan, you had mentioned this, a lot of it is course design, it's about how you um, set up your course, but I think that the more sort of varied ways in which you can try things that there's no, I don't think there's one thing that could really fit everyone. So just um, making a conscious effort of trying to do things that uh, for some people, group work could be excruciating, but you know, you kind of have them do that. But you have other opportunities that it's not just all group work. You have opportunities for that student to be uh, feel comfortable to, to be able to learn, to be able to express themselves. So I think that's part of it too, is to, to try different activities and also listen and think about the students. You know, getting feedback, you know, how did it work? Did it work? Um, well, if not, what happened? So I think um, there's no way we can um, anticipate uh, everything. But I think the importance for students is that they feel that they, their voices are valued, that it's heard. I think that's an important sort of um, also iterative process in which you're always trying to, to improve your teaching. I think that makes your classroom um, more inclusive. 
other comments from the panel? Um, yeah, to kind of build off of that, um, this specifically about accessibility, but there's been a move in terms of accessibility instead of just going to say CAE for accommodations to uh, move towards having like an anonymous survey that you always have up for your students and you could ask any questions on that. So a lot of times it would be um, any trigger warnings people want, any kind of food or allergies, but also you can add in things like what kind of activities are working well for your learning, how is the space working for you, have you had any issues accessing the space, and those type of things, if the students aren't aware how to say submit help tickets in case things aren't working accessing the space, then you get to know anonymously from students things that are working. And I've kept those kind of surveys up every single uh, week of the quarter and kind of reminded them like every other week. And I've gotten things up to week like nine and 10 about things going on in terms of new triggering material or things that were kind of off-putting for them, a student that was really disruptive that I didn't know before class was being kind of antagonistic mm -hmm. and people were anonymously writing things like that. So it's sort of like building on the listening. Did you have a sample of this? Yeah, um, I have a sample that I could send out. Um, I usually post it on the CCLE site for every single week and then I email it out to my students every other week. So then they reply to you directly to your so, email? Or? So the way I do it is I use Google Forms yeah. and it's anonymous and set up so that every time you get a response it emails you that there's a response. Um, so that, that way if you're only getting a response like once a week or once every other week you're going to get email notification but because it's anonymous they might feel more comfortable writing it down as opposed to I think a lot of us do surveys the first right. day of the class or <laughs> CAE type of things. Um, but because it's more anonymous and it's so more that's part you, of our CCLE, we have that option. Uh, the option on CCLE, you have an option for questionnaires, um, yeah, but, but then they you, know who. Is, no, uh, no you can make it anonymous, anonymous on CCLE. Um, I use Google Docs just because I think it has a bit more flexibility on the instructor side, as opposed to Help figuring you know. out uh, some of the things on CCLE are a bit harder to use. Um, yeah, and we have access to it right because of UCLA's Google formation, um, but. CCLE has the same type of form. They have questions you can fill out anonymously and have it set up to be open the entire quarter. So both of those are options yeah. for people. And, and I would just second that. We're just, we do that with, and we use Google Docs with the online courses. And we just have been getting kind of in the midterm feedbacks. And everything that we've said are things that show up. And I think that listening to the student voices is really important because one of the projects I did a while ago, you all, some of the faculty may remember that terrible survey that UCOP had us do about campus climate. Mm -hmm. um, so when I did the analysis on that for the Chancellor's Committee on Diversity, the faculty reported that roughly 75% of them, I can't remember the numbers, but these are in the range, thought the classrooms and the way they taught were inclusive. And they were doing it because did every student participate, did so on. Mm -hmm. And the student response was about 30% thought classrooms <laughs> were <laughs> inclusive. And in part of that, just one more example, um, and sorry, Adrian, I know you had to hear this before, but we've been talking with the folks at Center X over at the School of Education that have been doing a whole lot with how the um, community colleges have been using online education. And one of the things that is kind of anticipated for both student success and what it means to be engaged in a class was do you participate in the, the forums or the bulletin boards or whatever else? They then followed up with students on that to say, how did you look and I mean, how did you feel about that in terms of did you participate and how was their success over the class? And one of the, the uh, things that has shown up is that a number of people who never posted actually said that the forum was the most useful, one of the most useful things in the class because in that environment there were people who had no clue about what higher education was or what community college was and they were learning just from listening to the students who had a better idea and really kind of coming back with the notion that, I mean, as a teacher, I would have looked at that and said, no, these students aren't engaged. And the best part of that story, which I thought was just fascinating, was one of the students they talked to shared a phone account with their mother, 
and pointed out that not only all the kind of notices that were going out in the posts that were turned on, her mother was seeing too, and felt it was one of the best things for having her mother understand what was going on <laughs> on campus because of that phenomenon. So I think that's why one of the reasons that the student feedback, and you get a sense of what assignments work, and, and, and that kind of notion that I mean, what Kamiko's talking about, some of you may have gone to Epic's Universal Design presentations. That's really what universal design is, both for how does it, you know, is it ADA compatible and so on, but all the different kinds of learners and things like that. One of the things we're, we're trying to do is to make it possible to, for the instructor, and not everybody's comfortable with this, to move around the room more freely. Yes, uh, yes. And that Absolutely, includes, yeah. the, the simplest way is a wireless microphone. Uh, but we're also moving towards wireless access to the media system so you can use a mobile device to, for example, run a PowerPoint so you don't have to be tied to a particular place in the front of the room. A lot of our classrooms aren't built very well for that. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little bit difficult in a room where there's one center aisle or there's aisles on the right and, and the, the seats are against the back wall. Again, it's one of the things we're aware of and we're trying to make changes, but moving around the room and yeah, I think others trying, can talk about this more than I can, to. but it's one of the things we're trying to at least support with the technology to make it so you're not tied to one spot. Mm -hmm. I probably would, if, if we had a conversation about this, mm -hmm. I probably would ask you, why don't you create a uh, small activity that forces them to move? and just uh, create maybe a small group work and say, okay, you know, let's go down the line and just go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and everyone in group one, you know, go over here. So just any kind of activity Which that- Which I do, I do. Yeah. But usually the group somehow gathers where they are. No, no, but, so but, but sort of group activity can be sort of self-selected, talk to your neighbor, you know, that's, uh, that's a way that you can mm -hmm. easily sort of logistically uh, mm -hmm. do gr group activity, but you know, every now and then you might just say, okay, I'm going to have everyone whose uh, last name starts with an H go over there, you know, just anything that sort of moves them around to sort of mix get, it up. mix yeah. it up. <laughs> and you know, just use uh, sort of, yes, I understand that uh, I, I, my ideal would be a classroom in which you know, it looks like there's a front and, and um, you know, there's a front row, and then you can actually just go to the side and say, okay, this is a front, and everyone all of a sudden has to deserve, right. you know, that would be, you know, my sort of ideal way is that, you know, One but- day some, I start with the back. Exactly, the but you know, there mm -hmm. are ways to get your students moving, and sort of, um, I think some of the things that you could probably do in your class is forcing them to sort of move around, and, um, yeah, yeah, I haven't found, I mean, starting with age, mm -hmm. so I didn't think of that. Yeah, because something. otherwise, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, otherwise, you, if you ask yeah. those who are in the back row to come to the oh, front. Oh, no, 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 that, that's, that's kind of, no, uh, no I mean, that, that's not I a good idea. And I, and, and I think that would be a wrong approach because you're, ki you're kind of singling yeah, yeah, them yeah, out no, and sort of calling them out and saying, you're in the back, you have to come front. So sort of right. thinking of ways to just sort of changing it up, mixing it up, um, might be a good way to sort of start. I thought your first suggestion mm -hmm. of counting off mm -hmm. was a very easy way yes. to do it. Just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Then all the ones go together, all the twos. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's so I, I choose the one, two, three, well, four. No, 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 no. Like well, one at a time, they count. They can even say yeah. one, two, three, three four. four. But they're... Okay. They're going, oh, I so see. the people who are close yeah, to each other true. aren't going to end up close right. to each other. Okay. Not, yeah. And then they have to move in the yes. classroom mm -hmm. for, yes. for that time. Yes, yeah. right. Okay. <coughs> for the okay. task that yeah. they're doing. Right. Yeah. But presumably there's a real reason for them to be in groups. Otherwise, they're going right. to feel like, well, she just made me move mm -hmm. just because. Uh, and what would be the real reason except for inclusivity, which I'm not going to tell them just like that? <laughs> no, but I mean, you could have uh, one of the reasons uh, why we would encourage um, group, small group work is is oh yeah no yeah, I know yeah, why so small you could, yeah. group work yeah, 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 yeah. why yeah. one two three four that's obvious because I want to mix and match yeah that's and you right. could say yeah, that you right. know you want you know you've noticed that people um, yeah, tend to okay. sort of work with the same same you know friends and groups and we want to mix things up mm -hmm. yeah and simple as that okay. I think. yeah.
other one? Of course, course. seems okay. Um, <laughs> the one thing about asking people to move around is, um, especially when I am taking, I take language classes, and language classes always are kind of those set stadium seats where you can't move. Usually in those classrooms, there are two spaces where you can sit if you have access needs and can't use stairs. So it'll usually be the first mm -hmm. row or the last row. Um, and you often it'll be the last row where they have seats for uh, rollator users like me or wheelchair mm -hmm. users. And so some of those students, if you then ask them to move, they will just end up sitting there and not participating. Um, and that's happened to me in a few of my language mm -hmm. classes because I literally can't move around. I can't access any of the other aisles. And so then I'm kind of excluded from an activity. Um, and so then the professor kind of is like, okay, I guess I have to figure this out on the fly. So just being aware that some students might not be able to move, things like that, um, or letting the students, okay, group one, everyone who has like a one, figure out where you're gonna meet instead mm -hmm. of like one will be yeah. here, yeah. So less prescriptive, oh, but still yeah. grouping yeah. them together. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. part of knowing your students mm -hmm. and sort of being aware of that. So that if you have a student who is well, in a wheelchair, a wheelchair yeah. or yeah, something, you would, yeah. of course, mm -hmm. you see it if you have 50 or mm -hmm. 60 students, you might you not only get to know them mm -hmm. at the very end mm -hmm. a little. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. It's very hard to. Other questions or comments on that topic? So the, the next question actually is a sort of the evolution of what we've just been talking mm -hmm. about, which is how do we make design and de deliver classes that are as engaging and inclusive as possible when they consist of unusually large classes or have a fixed or inflexible seating arrangement? So the general topic of when the space doesn't comply with what we're looking for, how do you work around it? So I don't know if we've sufficiently covered that before or if you have more comments. I, I brought some tips. <laughs> Their last, uh, I, I can't speak to the large classroom sizes because frankly I don't have those classes, although I do have resources on the Hill. Um, I think Jenna Carpio again gives a talk about um, how to have large lecture halls that are still in inclusive. Uh, but some things I would think about uh, knowing your students and drawing on their expertise. So finding out when they come in, say, to office hours, uh, what sports are they into? What clubs are they into? What languages do they speak? What are they, were they up watching Avengers and Game of Thrones this past weekend as well? Um, so that when you start um, finding out more about them, you can draw them into conversations because you know um, they've really thought about, um, I don't know, the patriarchy in Game of Thrones, and that will somehow connect. Um, giving them a few minutes at the start of every class to announce events um, that they can invite their peers to. Um, just asking, like, does anyone have any, and giving samples for what that could be. So who's, is there anyone involved in Dance Marathon that wants to, like, you know, that's fundraising? Is anybody, um, you know, doing an event with their, with their club um, so that they start, so it feels more like a communal thing. And then when you can, actually going to those events. It makes a huge difference to the students um, when you show up. Um, giving them in, in class time for free writing, regardless of what your subject matter is, is incredibly helpful for discussions. Because um, there are students who are not comfortable thinking on the fly, who are very afraid of sounding dumb, um, who just can't collect their thoughts in time to speak. But if you give them five or 10 minutes at the beginning of class with a prompt, they can collect their thoughts and have them written. It's, they're far more likely to participate. Mm -hmm. It also can help with things like students coming in late, like you're not really sure when to start class because you want to have, we have that problem today, <laughs> you want a critical mass. So if you have a writing task at the beginning to eat up those five or 10 minutes, um, the people who are there get something out of it and the people who come in late can start with you. Um, have the students lead discussion or parts of discussion rather than you. Um, and inviting them to call on mm -hmm. each other mm -hmm. rather than you. So you really want the students talking to each other, not just like, you know, just you, the, the instructor on high and the podium at the front of the classroom. Um, and telling them ahead of time, this is the way the structure is going to be, and this is why we're doing it this way. Um, let's practice using each other's names. Um, it's totally fine that you forget. You're like, wait, you're Jenny? No, no, you're not, okay. Um, again, making it feel more, more like a community. Um, again, this depends on class size, uh, access to tech, and comfort level. Um, but having a class group me or a class Slack account, um, so basically ways that the students can communicate with each other um, that you are not on. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that way, if it's the night before 
night before something is due, they can very honestly say to each other, oh my gosh, I haven't started, help, what do I do? If they know that you can see it, they're not going to be honest with each other. <laughs> so this can be very helpful How for... Well, first I asked the students, um, I think it'd be great if you could be in touch with each other. What work works for you? The Facebook page, Slack account, group me, uh, texting, um, if it yeah, is... We're not so proficient with They that. are, though, and you don't they have are. to be yeah. on it. Oh, so what, I just suggest, I just tell them? Yeah. But who creates the Facebook Usually page? one of the they students themselves. does, or it's a Google Doc. Um, they do it themselves. Yes. And they just take care of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> And if, like, say, for example, someone is locked out of a class um, and they can't call me to tell me that they're locked out, they'll, hit, they'll ping someone else in the class mm -hmm. and then they'll go let them in. So they can solve a lot of problems um, with each other. But of course, you'd have to have access to a phone, tech, these sorts of things. But um, I've found in my classes more and more, um, it really helps with the community of the classroom to, to connect them in that way, especially with first years who don't know each other yet. Or transfer uh, students. I yes. Mm -hmm. They're very lost. Or right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you give them time the first day to set that up, like in class? Usually first or second. Like first, the first class, I'm still, um, still I'm doing a writing diagnostic. Yeah. There's still people kind of coming in and out. By the second class, I know, all right, this is probably who we're going to have. Let's talk about I want ways for them to communicate with each other. Here's some options. What do you all think? They let me know. Usually someone's like, I'm okay with starting it. And then, okay. and then they... Um, it's just like an app on your phone um, where you can leave, like you can have discussion threads and things. It's just way more user friendly than CCLE. Mm -hmm. It's what they already have and they what? already use. Mm -hmm. What is your experience with the Slack? Mm -hmm. oh, it's funny, I actually have to have it for working on the Hill. So that's, mm -hmm. It's how I communicate with the RAs. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a little bit of a learning curve for me, but it's pretty, pretty, uh, you know, it's like texting basically, yes. but you can have threads, you can search. You can put in a word like, oh, a few weeks ago somebody, yeah. you know, mentioned this term. I can't remember. Where do I find that email? There it is. No, I, I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. the, with, with the Slack, but I was wondering how, the, if, if, I think like it's always more used in the work environment. So I didn't know if the students are familiar with, with it. Yeah, I think one of the things you have to do is give them the sense that there's an advantage to doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so let me put this in hand. I teach 250 students regularly. Mm -hmm. um, so I have the big classroom problem, but I teach in the Hill, so I teach in Denev. Yeah, it's great. To so say. we have extra room and, and so on. But there are all kinds of different ways that you can, again, try to take advantage of that. And let me just give you an example of a couple. <coughs> so one of the things in the life sciences is they increasingly make use of having the TAs and learning assistants, undergraduates who have taken the course before, be part of the big room experience so that the professor pauses for a while and lets them answer questions. Now, there, there are problems and limitations in terms of very often there isn't enough space to go through the aisles and, and things like that. But they're finding that to be a really useful kind of way of kind of pausing, checking in, and things like that. Another thing that we see in a lot of the big classes, and there, there are different ways of doing this, but the social sciences has been, have been really looking at polling as a place, you know, the, the kind of iPhone-based eye clicker types of things that um, one of my friends who teaches, Miriam McClendon, who teaches giant Western Civ courses, has really started using basically a, a program called Mentimeter that um, is relatively inexpensive. You can get a free version if you only ask two questions at a time, but it lets you put in text answers as well as polling. And, I mean, she teaches you know, 16th century stuff too, so, you know, this, but kind of using these as places to both pause the lecture, but to create a discussion within the larger room as people defend their, um, why they but indicated. I'm not sure I understand how that works. Okay, so you have a phone, and she puts up a question built into her lecture okay. that says, um, I, I, I teach 20th century, so the 16th <laughs> century is hard for me. But, uh, but you know, so the kind of question which involves really having some knowledge of it, but maybe is anticipating what's coming next or what you, you know. Okay. And so 
if there are the kinds of things that say, um, you know, the Magna Carta was important or the Magna Carta laid out these kinds of things or, or something like that, where all of the ex questions are equally plausible, particularly if you're coming into the, the course for the first time and this is where you're learning things, you're going to have some who remember from high school what they're doing. Um, and then, then there's others who say, well, I kind of know what the Magna Carta is, and it could be any of these. And so you have the, the polling that shows up that, you know, 60%, I should let you explain, you no, clearly no, no, using just, it. Um, but all, all using of that is taking place during, your, instead of your yeah. lecture? It, as part know? of your lecture. It's kind of a pause in your lecture. It becomes a way of, yeah. of opening up a discussion. It's almost real-time yeah. trivia. You can yeah. see on the screen yeah. as they answer. Yeah. And, and then you can ask yeah. them why they think that the 60% one is right and... Well, so yeah, I know the only reason I'm nodding is because I found that this is a... I'm TAing for one of our professors. My name is Nina. And thank you so much for all of, for sharing your insight with us. Um, and I am TAing for Professor Mudares in the Italian department. And I just suggested to him to use a tool like this. But it's not Mentimeter. It's WooClap, mm -hmm. which the, actually a lot, it's similar. Yeah. But um, you get more for the free account, for the free right. version. Yeah. You can use it more often. And you actually can upload your PowerPoint presentations on it and incorporate a vast variety of questions. So yes or no questions, for instance, like a poll the multiple choice questions, open-ended questions where you write, for instance, why do you think uh, Lorenzo Valla wrote um, on the donation of Constantine? And then students can write a sentence. And so all of their answers appear on the screen. Mm -hmm. And so you get to comment uh, mm -hmm. on their answers. And they feel more comfortable participating um, and kind of seeing how you engage with their answers. And when you you know, when you show and that, you, you don't see who wrote what. Exactly. No, but that's what they like about they it. Yeah, they most of them don't want to participate because they're afraid of em yeah. embarrassment. Right. And um, another thing that came to mind, I just wanted to mention this for the question that you posed mm -hmm. before. I came up with a system this quarter that I find is working very well in my sections. So I also wanted everybody to have to participate without forcing them to and without making the calling on them on the spot and kind of singling them out. Mm -hmm. So based on the readings for each week, I post five discussion questions. There are 20 students in my classes. And I post five of them using the scheduler tool on CCLE. And then they have to pick one question that they will focus on and share their answer to in the discussion section on Friday. So they don't know who is signing up for the same question. So there are five questions, 20 students, four students sign up per question. Mm -hmm. And then the groups are always random. And they have to get together at the beginning of class with the people who chose to work on the same question. And then as a group, they all share their answers with everybody. Mm -hmm. And I found that students really like this because they're prepared to answer. Mm -hmm. They don't feel, you know, organically you're going to have other questions. and. Um, they will feel more comfortable answering them because they will have satisfied their participation, you know, credit. Um, so when they're prepared and when you've given them time to think about what they're going to say, they're much more willing to mm -hmm. participate. So I found that that really works. And I just thought that I would say this because I found that it was kind of an experimental thing that I tried and mm -hmm. it worked really well. Mm -hmm. Wait, how do you assign those questions? Oh. So I use the <laughs> scheduler tool. Yeah. And it's, I kind of played around with it. It's, um, of course, I tell them to disregard, you know, the time slots that I create, but I create five time slots mm -hmm. and make it so that four students can sign up for each one. I see. Okay. And then where it says location, I put the question. I see. Okay. And it's, I haven't had a single question, a single problem. Um, they love it. So I do it weekly now, and they're, mm -hmm. They really seem to respond well to that. Mm -hmm. There's actually no, yeah. a new tool called group choice where they can exactly. choose, they can choose exactly. a group so you wouldn't have the time yeah. stamps. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the inclusivity of the uh, what, how you're dealing with the fact that not everybody may have a smartphone or a laptop. Uh, that, that was my question. <coughs> in because I have, yeah, so I have a student with an phone. Anyone can check them out at the library yeah. um, mm -hmm. is well, for the laptops. For the laptops, but they work, yeah. they're functional in the same way for doing some of these things. Also, um, so in terms of what we talked about in terms of the polling tools, you know, there's many different tools that yes. you could use. And um, some of them are, you know, are stronger in certain things and, you know, some of them are stronger in other things. Um, really, 
you really should think about what am I trying to do because mm -hmm. there there are many different ways to um, uh, use these tools. Sometimes, you know, Adrian used it to clarify misconceptions. Uh, sometimes you could do it to just generate ideas, you know, um, as Jan said, you know, they could be plausible, either one, but, you know, we want the students to talk about it. Sometimes, um, it could be a feedback form for the instructor to say, okay, I just want to see how many people are really getting this <laughs> or not. So it really, the tool depends on, you know, what you're trying to do. And a lot of these tools w um, that have a f uh, are free, um, easy for students to use. But if you really want to have the... Um, uh, sort of take off all the responsibility for the from the students in terms of inclusivity. There are tools, uh, one of them um, is called Plickers, which is um, the students themselves, uh, so the instructor can pass out this little mm -hmm. card, um, and uh, the student, uh, what it is that each card is unique, and um, it just is like a barcode. And what it is that, depending on your answer, you just kind of flip it, um, the rotation, and they put up the card and it's the instructor that sort of scans it with their phone mm -hmm. and then it goes up on the screen. So there, there, but, you know, so that's a possibility. But there's even lower tech versions of this. You can have a color, a, a one piece of paper with four squares that have different colors. And you could say, okay, whoever thinks that answer A, show up A, and then you just hand count it. Right, there, but then you see them and that's... No, 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 because you're only showing it to, you see it, but the students can't, you can do it, sh put it in your chest so the next person can't see it. I mean, there's, there's sort the of... students themselves might be uncomfortable right. if the instructor can see Oh, but, it. yes, but that, that's when you do a right or wrong. I mean, there's there's different ways to, to do this, but sort of what I wanted to say is that the the idea is that um, you're trying to get uh, students to actively engage with the material, that it's not just passive. Um, I think all of what we talked about has elements, and that's true with um, what you said about writing beforehand, mm -hmm. and also, I'm sorry, your name, Nina. Nina had said about um, the discussion uh, questions. I think there's two key things that are important. One is ha letting the students have time to think. Um, because as you said, you know, everyone can sort of respond right away or, it, you know, you think that they're sort of not paying attention but all they're doing is really sort of collecting their thoughts. So mm -hmm. even if it's not necessary, I really like the idea of just saying, take a minute, write it down. And if they're not writing, say, I want to see writing, <laughs> I want to, you know, or typing. <laughs> the second thing is um, about sort of the sharing is that when they, um, even if it's something that they share with their group, when you share out, it's not about them anymore. They can feel more comfortable about sharing their opinion because it's not, they know that, well, all three of us thought it was this. <laughs> and, you know, it's not just, even if they get it wrong, it's not just about me right. anymore. So I think that, that makes it a lot easier and more, uh, makes them more confident about sharing in a group. And the one last thing I wanted to say is that um, we've talked about technology here, and I know that faculty are split um, in terms of how they feel about technology and use of technology. Um, there are some faculty who say, no technology whatsoever in my classroom. I don't want to see um, any phones out because when, or computers out because that means you're not paying attention. Uh, that means, you know, you're going to be on Facebook. Um, I think that I understand um, that sort of uh, um, inclination to feel that way, but I, I would be much more open to students and trust them and to allow the use of technology in certain situations mm -hmm. and be explicit. And there, there might be some times in which you say, okay, unless you need your computer to take notes, could you all you know, turn off your phones? Or now we're using this, let's open it up. So. I, I, I just wanted to bring that up because I, I hear a lot from uh, both graduate students, TAs, and faculty who will put it in their syllabus, you know, no technology whatsoever, and that is not necessarily inclusive either. Yeah, well, I used to do that because I actually prefer, well, when I would see, I'm, I'm a TA, usually. Uh -uh, I 
sorry, she reacts when people run. Um, yeah, well, generally, uh, I preferred not to have it, so I used to do that uh, for a discussion section, because it's not like they need to take a lot of notes, right? And then I realized that that was singling people out who may need their laptop for whatever reason, and so just to, so now I just say like, oh, I encourage you not to use it, but, but you can. Yeah. So I don't even Great. say like, but if you need to, you can use it. I just say you can if you want, but I encourage you to try just talking and listening. And, you know, Actually, you know. we have to realize that uh, students learn in different ways, mm -hmm. and yeah. some the current uh, students actually cannot do without it. Uh, you know, uh, they really uh, need it. And your point about you have to trust them, <laughs> and you know, even without the computers, if they are not uh, paying attention, they're not paying attention. So you you can't really force them, you can knock on their head. You, we feel tempted, you know, many times, like, are you there, kind of thing, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are not allowed to do that. Um, and the other uh, two things, I wanted to mention Kahoot, mm -hmm. which uh, does it very quickly, and it allows the student to, um, you know, call themselves XX or something like that, so that when the correct answer goes up, um, not only Am I testing that I did a good job of teaching and getting feedback on whether it was effective or not? But the students also, sometimes they think they got it, but when they notice uh, that they're one of four people who didn't get it, you know, then uh, it has an impact on them too. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is a shout out for Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tom has been uh, training us and now we're, uh, some of us are very good at it. It allows for, um, you know, these breakout uh, mm -hmm. uh, rooms, and the students just love it. So I hold um, online office hours every uh, week, and yep. then before exams and all, review sessions, and uh, at late at night, like 10 to 11 or something, and they will come on, and then they can talk to each other, and if I am forced to like repeat, go over something, we can record it mm -hmm. and uh, post it back uh, onto the course website so that others who are busy doing something else can later join in and watch yep. it and uh, learn from there. And they go on to the forum uh, link. And there's just so much uh, help and work and further things going on after I've gone to bed. You know, mm -hmm. so um, they're uh, forming this uh, community that is critical, I think, uh, again, to uh, modern students who are 21st century learners, uh, as we call them, right? Mm -hmm. And so we should be encouraging them. My last comment is um, lack of uh, charging things in classrooms. And what they end up doing is they set traps for me because, <laughs> um, by under the board is where all the blood points are and I come in and you know, it's, uh, you know and, and I tend to move around a lot and then so it, it, it is a problem and maybe it's cost or something but then when we uh, when I travel to other universities I, you know you find uh, either at the desk or on the floor, floor yeah. Uh, yep. So many uh, connecting points, and my very last uh, uh, complaint <laughs> <laughs> is every room has a different display system, and so oh, uh, yes. you know you <laughs> yes you, you just you learn one and and right <laughs> you get used to it, and then you move to another classroom, and it has like totally different things acting up, and some classrooms just have terrible uh, uh, sound uh, things, you know, so five students can hear it well, but not the students somewhere else, and so just some of the... <laughs> I won't speak to the second point, um, <laughs> because you're dealing with rooms that some cases haven't been updated in 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. We're working on them. That's the best I can tell you. <laughs> as far as the first point about power, it's something I'm 100% aware of. I have two kids that are graduating next month. One of them definitely is one of them. <laughs> 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 so 
seven-year program, so we're really hoping it's over. Um, but yeah, I'm totally aware about Kids in Power. It's one of the things we try and do in all the study spaces, all the outdoor spaces, if you notice how all have now power outlets near the tables. We do it in some of the classrooms. In some, many of our buildings, it's literally a problem with the amount of electrical load that you can have mm. in the building. Um, some of them just weren't built, like for this building, for example, wasn't built with any idea that there would be a huge number of use for power outlets in the future. Of course. Yeah. So there, the electrical load just isn't there. When it is, we are doing our best. Uh, one of my personal goals, I have three things I care about a lot, sound, light, power. Uh, lighting we're addressing, sound is much harder because again these were built at a time where people weren't really using acoustic engineers. Now we bring in an acoustic engineer every time we do a classroom. And as far as power, the place where it's needed most is in the large lecture halls where there might be a two-hour class, but power to each one of those seats is almost impossible unless you redo the whole building. We're aware. All these things are, are things we're aware of and we're working towards them and we're trying to do better. But, and I promised I wouldn't say, but here at UCLA, <laughs> too many times, but, You've been you know, very restrained. I've been really trying. <laughs> but there's, you know, 200 rooms, and some of them go back almost 100 years now, and it's very challenging to address all these issues. Yeah, some and, of the HVAC system is tied to the lights. Yes, it is. <laughs> so it seems that way. Yeah. We're trying to standardize things like, th there's only, really only two different presentation systems. It may seem like there's more, but there's really only two. If you're in a, now if you're in a departmental classroom, then you're on your own, uh, because I don't do those. But of the 192 general assignment classrooms, there's the old analog ones and the new digital ones. And eventually they'll all be the new digital ones, and then those will get replaced with holograms or everything. Like that all be gone. Um, or maybe we'll just have good internet connections in all the rooms. You mean wireless? That'd yeah. be nice. Mm -hmm. That'd be nice. You deliver it that way. Yeah. So just to echo what uh, Pam said, one of the things we've discovered with a couple of our classrooms where we teach remotely, so we're teaching the students at other UCs at the same time synchronously, mm -hmm. is that these are actually recorded over Zoom, is when they are recorded that way, we were surprised to see how much playback there was mm -hmm. from the students in the mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. In fact, from an anecdotal standpoint, a Swedish instructor um, would go over every grammatical point twice, and one day she forgot to record, and the students asked her, and she said, oh, I forgot to press record. They go, could you please? Hit record and go over one more time. <laughs> and we realized going back and looking, they were act, they were going back and looking at this. Yeah. Right. And it became, also became very important to start reshaping your instructor uh, presentations. So instead of having one slide that's filled, mm -hmm. having ten that have one point on it per each, because when the students are looking on the video, they can scrub it and see exactly what you're what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Don't have to watch a twenty minute discussion of a single whiteboard. Actually, the students can record too. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes, you know, I may forget, but then, you know, some of them remember or, or whatever. Or uh, depending on what they need uh, from me, they don't uh, need further help on one section, but they need help on a different one. So then they record the part that's relevant to them. I mean, it, these are all. It's so wonderful to be teaching today. No, I'm going you back to learning think. styles where somebody yeah. might want to yeah. watch that six times. I, they don't want to ask in class. Yeah. I have had the problems with texts, on the other hand, and, and technology, because my texts are all free on the, the 17th century. And so I don't have them buy more than one book, maybe, and the rest of the texts are excerpts, and I put them on the CCLE. However, I ask them to print the text and to bring them to class, and they don't. But when I say page 356 instead of page 256, then they're scrolling <laughs> down a hundred page, well, it's not a hundred page, but you know, they can't find anything because they cannot, as you, when you open the book, I say page five, everybody's on page five. So there are ways of dealing with some of that, just in terms of PDF files. You can put the page numbers in, you can put area headings in, and so on. That, that's part of one of the questions, and this gets back to some of the accessibility issues, is one of the problems we have um, is that for a lot of faculty, the, the single biggest advantage of something like CCLE is you can put the readings up. 
-hmm. and you can do the kind of excerpts and so on. But for most places, a lot of places, those files are created as images. They're not searchable and so on. So one of the things that we're trying to work with um, uh, the folks who are in the ADA group at uh, OIT, for example, is to be able to come up with a way that when you scan something in as an image, that it can go through a processing situation so it becomes a document that, that can be searched by word and that you can then in PDF, you can do this in, in a variety of different ways. You can just go to page numbers and then if you're starting at page two or page 12, you can do the subtraction and get pretty close to where you're doing. So you can you look at. There way we're, well, we're work. You can do it in a variety of okay. different ways. Adobe uh, Acrobat Pro mm -hmm. actually yeah, yeah, does yeah. some of that. It's not perfect. There's a high error. There's a really high error rate. Right. Yeah. But but this is one of the things that that the folks over at, there at OIT are really working on uh, how to do this, and it's it's both accessibility issues so that you can do it with readers and so on, but it really does help with exactly the problem you're doing because as long as it's images, you can't get the page numbers, you can't do the navigation, but if it's down as text, you can then do the mapping and so on. So this is something that we but really are. Something that we have to do? We're, we're tr so the question we posed to them, right, was uh, one of the ways we've operated with the system is that, in my department at least, so I'm not, I mean, history is as good as anyone to kind of look at. We, we have work study students do the scanning. They do it as images, and then it gets loaded up into CCLE, right? So it's all there with the files and so on. The faculty often don't touch any of it. Sometimes the faculty do. But the question we've been asking is, if we start mandating to make everything inside CCLE to be ADA compatible and so on, what is the way that we can make this a transition that we don't have to have the faculty know how to do it, right? And so Travis Lee, in particular, has been looking at tools beyond Adobe Pro, which has uh, Acrobat Pro, which has its own problems, that actually does that. So it becomes a kind of seamless way that either we can do it um, with a handful of people who are work study students or whatever who know how to do it, but you know that takes it out of the faculty responsibility because again, it's going to get easier and easier. But right now, it's a bit of a pain in the neck. So uh, you're absolutely right with that and. There are ways to deal with that, and we're working on how to deal with it. So when you say we, you mean his, the history department? No, no, I'm well, working. Uh, right now it's OIT that's mostly working on this. We've been cooperating with them okay. because this becomes an issue in all kinds of ways because the online courses, we made a deal yeah. with CAE, yeah, that it. we would make everything <laughs> um, available, ADA compatible from the beginning. So all the videos we do and everything else, you know, are sent out to 3Play and everything else so that we have the closed captioning and so on. But the biggest nut to crack, quite honestly, is all these PDF files that everybody's been using and it's been an issue. So that's gotten to be a high priority for both ADA compatibility, but also for the kind of how do you deal with that? And, you know, how do you, um, and there, there are ways out there. I mean, right, if you use something from the library, for example, JSTOR isn't perfect but comes close to being perfect <laughs> compared to what happens if you take the same article from the American Historical Review and scan it yourself. <laughs> so we've also had the library involved in terms of how they can help with making this happen. So it's it's like yeah, classrooms, it's too. It's a multi-pronged yeah. uh, re issue. And we'll add this list of how you negotiate those 16th century texts in terms of things like that. Yeah. So, so first here, and then there, then I want to say something. Okay. <laughs> well, just a couple quick fix ideas for your mm -hmm. problem is that maybe you can have the chapters as each individual PDFs so that they don't have to navigate these enormous documents. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, no, they're not enormous, but yeah. even 20 pages yeah. of you know yeah. 17th century text are not easy. You not still, easy. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. still need time, but yeah. And then another idea is to like if uh, have them go to thumbnail view, and then it's easier to like zoom in and out from thumbnails to the reading view. Right. That might be a faster way to navigate the document. 
Is it just a couple? I don't even know what the thumbnail view is. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the contact view. Right. It's when you can see all the pages of the entire document. Uh, yeah, you know, the tiny okay. little. Yeah, so if they go to that view, it might be easier to jump ahead. Or yeah. jump behind or and you can also project the page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in the, so the they can tell. Screen. What I, use, I, I, I do it all the time. The sucky page, I mean, we can go over the page. I don't Because I agree. Projector. Projector, project the top. Yeah, you have to access to your your CCLE and uh, open the document, and you can protect the page. Okay. Page yeah. there, and it's very useful. It's very useful. They <laughs> love it. <laughs> Maybe ask one of your students to. Uh, okay. That's what I'm doing anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't even access the CCLE in the class when I'm what need to tell them something, so they help. But still. Okay. Um, a couple of things. So the software that's being mentioned, not just at UCLA, but elsewhere and on like the tech side where they have way more money, they're actively working on right. trying to come up with technology that's going to convert these PDFs because it's not just us in academia. It's like everyone has these yep. issues with PDFs. They're just a very frustrating form. So, I mean, it is actively changing. And I mean, in terms of accommodations, especially for readers, uh, they can't go through if it's image they files. Kind of yeah, it just will say image it. one, then image right. two, and that's how your reader would see it if it was a PDF. Yeah. So, I mean, it is actively being changed, especially right. from like coming from the blind and visually impaired community. Like they're actively like moving this on the forefront. So that technology is probably going to come Maybe from the paid years. form. Yeah. yeah, but it's probably well, going to be like coming Google from translate. First. <laughs> I have to say, I don't know about other language teachers, but uh, our way of teaching has changed drastically with Google Translate improving. Mm -hmm. I cannot ask them to write papers at home anymore, or take home exams. Uh, no, no, because they write it in English, they turn it out in French. And by now, it can almost look pretty good. <laughs> and, and it's harder to make out, oh, this, uh, this is Google Translate, this is not you. You can't do that. So it has to be written in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, out by hand. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, I, I the same thing, yeah. <laughs> it's so it's We've got one more question. Um, so I didn't interrupt for a long time because the conversation anticipated <laughs> all of the questions. <laughs> so I wanted to know what the questions were, and there's one that maybe hasn't been addressed. So what are some techniques that help activate all voices in the classroom? And we talked about that a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe not so much this. Conversely, what are some impediments that inherently stop all voices from being activated? That's, that's an interesting one. What are some quick and effective techniques to increase participation? I think we talked about that. Uh, this one we haven't talked about. How do we make, design, and deliver classes that are as engaging as possible when they are set at unideal hours <laughs> of the day? Mm. That's a big one for me. Mm. Um, so uh, go ahead with your question. Um, I forget your name already. Andy. Go ahead with your question. And then if you want to, if anyone wants to talk about any of these or anything else. Sure. It was for Tara. Tara. <laughs> and um, uh, you mentioned taking your students to the aquarium, and I'm wondering how did you um, facilitate that? They all take their own cars. I got to have a residency at the University of Michigan, and they have cars for students that are insured by the university and they can take to go to different places. So. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, if it's gonna be a community engaged project, um, going through the Center for um, Community Engagement, um, they have lots of, they'll introduce you to the waivers that you need to get. Um, and if it's local and you're going to be encouraging students to be taking, say, the Big Blue Bus or public transportation, you'd be surprised how many of our, how many of our students have never used public transportation um, and all the things that kind of come up around that. Um, sometimes, like, for service learning, the students will solve each other's problems. Again, um, I found that the bus was taking so incredibly long that all of them were going to Uber. Mm -hmm. And of course that's worth talking about too. Like what does it say about our communities that people who can't own cars are reliant on our terrible public transportation or that communities where there aren't stops and all those other things. But uh, what we found out was the students figured out on their own if one person would sign up for Uber and then you get the free ride, they would give it to the next student who then would sign up and give the free ride to the next student. So they did all kinds of things to bring the costs down. Um, you poor Uber driver. <laughs> um, uh, so there are there are funds that you can apply for um, in different ways in terms of getting students. You can't drive students in your car. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I can if they are I employees of the university, meaning the RAs. So I can actually take the RAs, but I can't take um, I can't take students in my own car. Um, if you're doing an event through the Hill, they have their own kind of funding, um, so they can you can charter a bus um, if there's a bunch of people going. Sometimes they will have ways of defraying costs, um, where the student groups will pitch in a certain amount of money. Um, you know, and like students have a five dollar donation. There's a, a couple different ways of doing it, um, but sadly we cannot just drive as much as I I would want to. Um, so the, the aquarium trips, um, we've done a mixture of uh, renting a bus one time. One time it was just a whole bunch of Ubers, um, and that's a that's a long way, and it made me very nervous because I was trying to keep track of all of the, where everybody was. Um, so I was not I didn't love that option. Um, but yeah, if you have an idea of something you want to do for English 3, let's talk offline um, about ways to make it happen. Because uh, our students, uh, there's a real problem that they don't leave campus. Yeah. Oh yeah. And we want them to see LA. We want them to be yeah. thinking about more than going to Third mm. Street Promenade. Mm. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll go, I'm going to, I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. Mm. I know that she has something. No, uh, I just wanted to <laughs> just add in a little plug, um, our office, or all center, uh, CAT, has um, mini grants um, that um, both graduate students as TAs as well as faculty can apply for. And um, uh, a lot of them, uh, a lot of faculty use it for um, guest speakers. But one of the things that we do do is uh, support uh, field trips. Mm -hmm. And that can be in different forms. Um, there's a limit. Uh, in the academic year, it's six hundred dollars. So we encourage ways to, you know, uh, try whether it's um, you can get reimbursement for gas, uh, Uber. I think works too. Public transportation works. Renting uh, a bus from uh, campus. Re but renting a bus from absolutely uh, renting the car. It, those are options, but they're expensive. So you know, if you're doing it multiple times. Um, that that might not work out, but I have um, often encouraged faculty <laughs> who say, well, we're going to go downtown and we want to um, rent a whatever, and I say, well, have you thought about public transportation? And if they said, well, yes, but it takes, you know, three hours just to get to wherever because the tribes, then we'll try, you know, we'll think of other ways, but that is one option um, of uh, using our mini grants. Um, I no, didn't I was interrupt. To say that I'm going to take my students to the Getty Center mm -hmm. um, in two weeks, and we're going to carpool, and I just got free parking at the Getty. So uh, by emailing them or through? No, they're going to they're going to get there and they they won't pay for the for the parking but because it's very expensive. Right. But how, but how are you you're driving them? No, no, no. I can't drive. No. <laughs> students okay. driving each uh, other. They, yeah. they, I, they some students them. have. Cars, so they're gonna carpool. And so, but who's paying for parking on their behalf? Is the Getty because the Getty, providing the free? Getty, yeah, okay, the Getty. Getty. And yeah. well, that's I'll true of a, and I, yeah. uh, and it's true of a number of museums. For right. example, if you want to take your class to LACMA, you just tell them it's a class, and they will let them in for free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, someone had to pay for the gas for that car, but um, it's just once in a quarter. <laughs> I didn't get to talk about my lobster. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I mean, part of it is just I love props. Um, I've read it. It says, consider me. This is when I teach. Um, David Foster Wallace says, consider the lobster. Um, but I brought it actually to talk very briefly about being careful about the assumptions that we make about our students. I think that's one of the biggest impediments to being inclusive. Um, and there's assumptions that you don't even realize you're making, like the fact that your students are housed. Um, we have homeless students in our, our yeah. population, <laughs> like, and it's shocking when I talk to people outside of my department about this. So things about ass assuming that, um, you know, that your students had whatever a traditional K through 12 American public school upbringing is, whatever that is, um, or assuming that, you know, they have access to things like computers or phones, mm -hmm. um, assuming that, you know, they have a support system at home. Um, assuming that if they didn't do the work for your class, it's because they slacked off when, in fact, they have multiple jobs or all these sorts of things. Um, so in this case, I, I assume that my students knew lobster as a food. Um, like, uh, I assume that they knew it was expensive, I, that they knew what it tasted like. I assume that they knew what a lobster looked like. 
Um, and these are relatively minor assumptions, but when we started talking about the, this text and I realized how many of them had no idea of any of the cultural stuff around lobsters. Um, so I ended up buying this just to kind of bring it in so we could talk about like it looks like a bug. Um, and so and the history of this thing is actually really important for understanding the document. Although this one is a main lobster, the ones off of our shores incidentally don't have, our, our California lobsters don't have claws, um, which is a whole separate thing. Um, but it was like something very, very basic that I couldn't believe. I, it didn't occur to me how many students had never had lobster or knew what it means in an American culinary context. Um, so just kind of keeping that in mind that you can't always know where the students are coming from and you have to build in these, these ways of checking during the class. Um, giving them an opportunity to tell you the things that are going going wrong for them so you can either help them or direct them to the place on campus that can help them because um, there's so much that you can't possibly anticipate. Um, so I think that's just one of the things I wanted to mention. And, and you can kind of flip it around in interesting ways. So the riding public transportation, it's most likely the kids who don't have cars who come from a different kind of background. So the whole experience of riding the public transportation, I mean, when we, because I use this as an assignment, it's, it's so amazing to have somebody raise their hand and say, the person sitting next to me in the bus asked me out, should I go? And you could kind of hear the, the chuckling from the people who ride public transportation all the time and you know the whole kind of experience, the ethnography of riding the yeah. bus. But some of those things you can just flip around in ways that change the axis of, of yeah. kind of inclusion and so on and expertise. That taking Around, advantage of those kind of, I mean, I grew yeah. up in the Midwest. I didn't know what a lobster was. Um, <laughs> <Wasn't it? laughs> right. Around the same thing, at the end of each class, I asked my students, what is your advice for the next group of students coming in? And then I put that in my syllabus. Yes. Um, I couldn't believe how many of them were, were waiting on the wrong side of the street for the bus. Right. Um, something that basic. They were all going in the wrong direction. And I never thought to tell them. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until they told me. Um, so like polling your students when you try something new and ask them like, should I do this again? What worked? What, you know, what did you wish that I had done? Um, cause they are really, really good at helping each other. And if you can get looped in on that, then they do a lot of the work for you. And you know, to go back to the kind of polling software and everything else, one of the most effective uses I saw was one of the polls that let you create word clouds. Mm. And it was a, the first assignment was word clouds, you know, where you have the big words and what is most common. Um, okay, well, I should have brought a prop, but, but basically it, you could, it takes like all the words in a document or everybody, in this case, they were asked, what word came to your mind when you thought of Africa? Uh -huh. And they did it the first day of class. And so, you know, there were words like poverty or there were, you know, words like colonial or whatever. They, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, same thing, yeah. <laughs> and, and then they asked the same question at the end of the class what word identified Africa? And they put the two together. They did this, they invited the online class to come. Uh, meet and broad so they could actually meet each other in person. And it was just stunning as a way of their own assessment of seeing how much their attitudes and what they knew about Africa had changed uh -huh. over that simply by the words they used mm -hmm. to describe what they knew about Africa. And it was, it was fascinating to watch the students in this kind of very easy way to look at assessment and, and they could see how their words had changed and things like that. Mm. So they're all, the, again, it's the kind of being able to bring the students and what they've thought about and learned in it in a way that ends up being very positive and making it kind of a more inclusive and engaged environment. One thing I did want to mention real quick, because I do have children in college and they both went back east, regional differences make a huge, oh, yeah. are a huge mm -hmm. thing. My California daughter is in Rhode Island and just was lost. Mm. Right. Uh, people would talk about things and she had no idea and then she would talk about her cultural references and they had no idea what she was talking about except she was the cool one from LA. <laughs> um, and so regional differences can make a huge difference when it comes to what people know and what they don't know. Like I didn't know that there's two different kinds of lobster. I thought they all looked like that. <laughs> so but maybe something we can have today we can do without, we can live without knowing that difference. But <laughs> 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 yeah. I just want
uh, did anyone have any answers for the time question, the, the uh, teaching at Oh, at oh, at oh, at I mean, hours. my small thing would be acknowledging it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And just like, and giving them freedom to bring the coffee, the sugary drinks, the whatever it is they need, um, rather than like pretending that anyone wants to be in this room at 7 a.m. or whatever it is, um, or 7 p.m. or right after lunch, or like, I think that's one of the things I could think of is just acknowledging it's difficult. And they do come to uh, Nev in their pajamas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had one student who was sleeping in the first row. Like completely like that, <laughs> falling asleep. And one day I brought a double espresso. And I came in front of him and I brought this purposefully for you. And I will bring it every time if you don't end this sleeping. <laughs> it I wish someone would bring me a double espresso. <laughs> Just kind of whether they're active or not, this is maybe totally irrelevant. But one of the things we were concerned about when we first started teaching up in the dorms, and, and this was the sixth this class. We were doing a panel discussion in front, and so everybody was supposed to be paying attention to the panel discussion, and we had one of the faculty members' wives graciously said they would send an email to all the students that said, if you're reading your email right now, you're not in the spirit of the 60s, which is be there. <laughs> and so we were sitting in the front waiting for this to happen, and the time passed and it didn't happen. We thought, well, maybe everybody's paying attention. She actually was running a little late, and about 10 minutes later, you could see all these panicked faces. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they all went to the TAs and said, do they know whether we got that? I mean, it was going to affect our grades, but it was just kind of an interesting way to uh, turn the technology around. This is, I don't know if this will help any of you, but what I have tried doing, and it works marvelously, is writing some clues on pieces of paper and hiding them around the room. You can do this wherever, and they all have to get up and look for them together. And it's basically like a puzzle, and they have to figure out what you're trying to get at. So they all have to get up out of their seats, look around the room. It's like a scavenger hunt that isn't really a scavenger hunt. And then they have to piece it together or think critically. And so mm -hmm. that automatically wakes them up as getting up yeah, and okay. you know, having to think. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even little competitions like Socrative.com, um, where basically you have, uh, they do it through the phone again, but they have to pick a color for their team. And then on the screen, if you pick unicorns, for instance, you'll have a pink unicorn, a green unicorn, da, 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 and they're all listed. And as they get questions right, their unicorn jumps. And they want to get yeah, to the no. end. Yeah. They love it. <laughs> Sorry, that's so loud. <laughs> But I find that the one with hiding things around the room and making them get up out of their chair works. And also dance parties. Like one minute dance parties that sometimes work, other times they fail. Yeah. <laughs> what was the name of that website again? Socrative. Socrative.com. You know, a lot of, we've been talking a lot about technology. I don't know if you realize that. We have sixty percent of our conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, you know, when I when I teach, I'm really concentrated on somehow what it is that I want to tell them and them to learn from that. So maybe I'm less concentrated on how, but there is so much to be done with that already that I don't know how you guys find time to deal with all of this, like, you know, let them get up, yeah, let them five minutes, but then the class is gone. We haven't even started yeah. talking about. So I'm going to give you a technological solution we're looking at, so sorry about that. But one of the things that, that seems to be emerging again in the kind of notion of things are what annotative, the kind of annotation programs. So you can actually go in and take a document and actually annotate the kinds of things you want them to look at as a model. And you can do this with photos, you can do this with videos and so on, or maps and so on. So you can actually create this kind of notion of whatever your 16th century map is and say, think about this and you can tell from here that, oh, they have sea monsters out here or, you know, how the boundaries have changed and so on. And set up a way of letting the students then use that kind of annotation software to go in and 
take a text, for example, and pull out the pieces and again to generate discussion and so on. In some ways, it's, it's not a whole lot different from when I would take my comparative literature courses when I was in college, but it provides models that they can go back to and understand and, and lets them again bring their different kind of interpretations. So you've created your own kind of, uh, I guess they're spark notes now. It was, or invite the students to make yeah, it themselves. Exactly. Uh, they have one of their projects be make some sort of video or thing that will help future classes learn this concept. Right. And then they make it and now you have it and then you can just put it on CCLE as long as you get permission from credit. the students <laughs> yes. because it's their intellectual property. But you see this with like the, the chem, was it the 14B, the videos where yeah. there's music videos to help teach um, chemistry principles right. and mm -hmm. they are really amazingly well-made things that the and students funny. make that are funny and now there's a body of them that just keeps growing that other students can learn from. So you don't need to have all this tech savviness to, right. you just need to create a space where the students can take off with the stuff they already know. Um, in a way that is helpful, if that yep. makes sense. Mm -hmm. If I so. could just add, sorry. Please. Okay, uh, one of the things we did in one of the EPIC workshops, I can't remember if it was Tilt or video, but um, it's important that the instructor not sacrifice what's, what's stop, okay, shh, shh, that they don't sacrifice what's comfortable for them, you know, in order to be an effective teacher, you can't be trying to force something that feels unnatural. Yeah. Right. And right. I totally That's agree that I actually don't prefer to use too much technology Especially like uh, sometimes if I'm using a PowerPoint, they're just staring at it. They're not really listening. I just want to talk to them and like create a space that they can like feel comfortable. So a lot of like the things we talk about using making polls and stuff, you can use flashcards to do that or whatever. But um, no, I just wanted to say it's important not to sacrifice your own yeah, style. Style. Yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. yes. I think yeah. that's a perfectly supportive note on which to end.